Okay, welcome uh, to part two of uh, session one, uh, talking about applications in terms of SUAS operations over active eruptions in Hawaii. Um, great, wonderful first session. Thank you all for your participation and interest. Uh, a lot of great questions and really interesting to, to see these folks from all over the world. Um, because, so we'll see how we are for time. I, I, um, I, I do want you guys to have an opportunity to uh, communicate with each other, um, but I also uh, want to make sure that, that, that you get us, actually, let's do a poll. Let's do a poll. I'm gonna, let's see if we can do this. Let's see if I can figure this out. Um, let me see my screen share here. Well, let's forget the poll. Sorry about that. Um, let's rather than wait, let's save the breakout room for the end, um, if that's okay. Um, uh, so what I'd like to do, and I, I think I think that might be a, a, a better a better use. So what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about two eruption events uh, here on the Big Island of Hawaii, and I think uh, that can show these uh, uh, demonstration of, of, of how, how we use this and, and maybe some ideas for other folks um, who might use this in, in their neck of the woods. So this is a portion of um, East Hawaii and it's showing the, the flow outline of the Pahoa flow, which occurred uh, between 2014 and, and 2015. And this is an image uh, showing uh, what it looks like from some helicopter data uh, during the eruption. And so you've got visible on the left and thermal on the right. And um, that Pahoa Village Road, that's a really important road. So that road is a kind of the lifeline for this community in Pahoa uh, to the other portions of the island. So if that road were to be cut off, it would have caused major, major issues uh, for the, the community. And uh, luckily the flow stopped right before uh, crossing, crossing that road. But at that time, their SUAS or drones were very, um, still relatively new um, and certainly in, in Hawaii. And so this was an opportunity for my lab um, working together with civil defense and the US Geological Survey to, you know, just use these drones to determine, you know, are they useful for doing active lava flow mapping? And again, a lot of this was spearheaded by uh, Nick Turner, who I'm highlighting over here. He really started this and I just sort of uh, uh, took it and ran with it. Uh, can we use these uh, instruments to generate timely geospatial data for civil defense in the US Geological Survey? And can we um, use this to improve our understanding and the predictability of um, Pahoa lava flows. So these were some of the uh, experimental goals that we were interested to, to play around with. Um, and so the SUAS in 2014 were not an integral part of the eruption response like they were in 2018. Um, but they were, it was a time for us to sort of figure some things out. And so this is um, a, a screenshot from the type of uh, mapping that we would do. So you can see the yellow path of the mapping, autonomous. Um, and so the, the drone would, would fly and, and it would go through and it would, it would basically do this lawnmower pattern and, and map the area, taking, taking photos. Uh, we had a, 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 a good flight crew, so all FAA certified, including actual uh, pilots. Um, the, the regulations were different than they are now. For the first flight, we actually also had the fire um, department's helicopter kind of uh, tailing our drone um, uh, just to make sure that uh, everybody was in communication and, and nothing went wrong. A ground control station, uh, launching, and then the, the, the type of flight path that we would, that we would follow. Um, and so we would fly, this is, and we would collect hundreds and hundreds of photos with a lot of overlap. And then we would use that uh, overlapping imagery to process 
to generate different products, including an ortho mosaic, which is uh, what's shown here. Um, and this is done with a near infrared camera. Um, we did a number of flights over uh, about a month, um, covered about a half square kilometer per flight. And the imagery was about four or five centimeters resolution. Uh, this is a picture of one of our ground control points. And so this is what I was talking about. There's these, uh, we put out big white X's, painted them on the, hopefully uh, surfaces are not gonna move around. And then we surveyed them in with differential GPS equipment. Uh, we have 17 across this section of the, of the flow. And our error for the GPS was on the order of a, a couple centimeters. Now, if you put ground control points out in an environment where there are active lava flows, your ground control points may be covered up by lava. And we had that happen on more than one occasion. Um, but this is one where our, the Pele, she decided to spare our ground control point. She went around it and then stopped. And so that lava uh, ground control point was, was safe. But we had a number of other ones which were eaten and covered up by the lava. Um, the mapping that we were doing at, at this time was using the Swinglet cam. And so the, the software that we used for flight planning was called eMotion. And it was this proprietary uh, software that we primarily used. <clears throat> this is a, uh, if it works, a little video showing the three-dimensional point cloud that we generated. So these strange looking symbols up here are the locations of the, the photos, uh, the photos which were taken. It might be a little bit hard to see, but these little colored areas here are the ground control points, right? It's sort of distributed around the area. You, you want to have your ground control points distributed all around the area that you're mapping. You don't just want them on one edge or in a straight line. You want them evenly distributed around the, uh, around the area. And let's see if I can just make this guy play. So this just gives you a sense of this, this sort of, yeah, three-dimensional point cloud of the lava flow that we, that we captured. It looks a little choppy, but hopefully you guys are, are, are seeing this okay. And at one point here, if I can, Yeah, it looks a little choppy on my machine, my monitoring machine, but should give you a sense. So, and then from this point cloud, we can generate um, surface models and things. But something I do wanna just, just um, bring to your attention, if you look on the left-hand side of your screen, and you see the tops of the trees over here, and then below this, you see a bunch of black. And that's because it's a passive optical system. And so, if it's in a dense canopy, vegetation canopy situation, you're not going to be able to penetrate through there to get any photons that actually hit the ground surface. And so it's, what you get is an absence of information below the tree crown. So if you really need to know what the ground surface is like there um, under these, these tree canopies, just using photogrammetry with RGB cameras, you'll have, an, you'll have gaps. We'll have gaps there. Now, you, if it's a relatively small area, you can interpolate across, um, but it's not gonna be like you actually had a, a, a measurement there. So that's, that's one limitation. But on the lava surface itself, it's great. You got all kinds of data. You, got, you actually have more data in terms of the number of points than you would with a, with a LIDAR system. So we flew this section and we flew it again and we kept on flying it. And so we generated sort of a, a time series of this, of this area. Um, there's a question about the, the overlap. Um, today, we usually fly, uh, it, it depends on what we're doing, uh, usually 80 to 90%. Um, uh, uh, at this time, I think it was more about 70%, um, 70, 70. I, I think it, that was uh, what we were running at that case. Um, I want to zoom in on, on one section of the flow here and just share with you um, some of the information that we can get by taking advantage of the, our ability to control when we fly and to fly a lot. And so this is just this one section of the flow. The top is showing you um, the ortho mosaic, and then the bottom is showing you the digital surface uh, model. And the colors represent elevation, and you'll see over time. So this was uh, on uh, uh, October 31st, 2014. And then a week later, we flew a bunch. We, we flew a lot that day, all in the same day. And so start at 7, 13 in the morning, and then the last flight was at you know, 1600. Um, and, 
And during this time, you can see the evolution of this, this, this tumulus structure, which is, which is just coming up. And to be able to capture this kind of information um, and have confidence in the, the data that you're collecting is, is fantastic. And then flights a little bit later. So again, we're, 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 we're capturing the evolution of this, not necessarily in real time, but able to see these, these quickly changing uh, landscapes in a way that hasn't really been possible um, before without you know, an incredible amount of money uh, for a manned aviation. And or if you're doing ground-based measurements, you're just going to uh, capture a small little area. So the, the SUAS provide this wonderful bridging uh, technology. Uh, we did some work with uh, Hawaii Community College and Victor Rosgado, who's shown here, and we actually surveyed a transect uh, across this flow. So as we were also flying the drones, we had folks on the ground um, who would survey in uh, along this, this, this pathway when it was safe to, to do so. And that's what's shown here. Um, you're actually seeing the, the survey data, and over time, you see this, this little tumulus start to sort of peak up, and is great. We're able to, to, to pick up that pick up that information. I'm going to admit some more folks here. Um, and if we look at a regression between the the total station survey ground equipment and the elevations that we extracted from the digital elevation model from the drone, we see just beautiful agreement, right? Um, so so very tight agreement. Uh, what we are generating from our drone data using our ground control points and what we got from the independent uh, surveys. So we're, we're quite happy about that. And in terms of the, the, the vertical errors, um, you know, in terms of the, the standard deviation and such, about eight, nine centimeters. And that's actually what was shown in that, that paper that I showed earlier when they were using the PPK. Um, and this is about nine centimeters or so. So that's kind of the tolerance. And when these flows are changing by many meters, you know, plus or minus uh, uh, eight or uh, 10 centimeters, that, that I can live with that error. That, that's perfectly fine. <clears throat> so looking at the flow evolution over time, uh, we're able to look at, you know, elevation differences. Uh, how many people involved in situ for a survey? Um, if you're using a total station, you actually just need two people. You need someone, or if it's a robotic system, you just need one. But typically uh, two people, we're just talking about the ground survey part, uh, one person to hold the staff with the reflector on it, and the other person to operate the, the total station instrument. Um, that's, and you need the instrument. So you need two people in the instrument. If you have more people with more reflector rods, you can cover more ground. Um, let me let this person in as well. Okay, so these maps I'm showing you are elevation differences. So um, relative to the flow uh, coverage um, from 1031. So what the elevation was on 1031, this is the difference, what it looked like on 1105 and uh, 1106, the first flight of the day uh, and the next flight of the day. And you can see these, these changings occurring. And this is a week later. And then another you know, a few days later. And so again, we're able to um, uh, 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 capture um, these types of these types of changing. Um, so there's a question about pyroclastic flow. So this is a pohoihoi lava flow. Um, so it's a relatively slow moving um, uh, kind of uh, kind of flow. And the data that we have collected from this, we've used for some. Um, uh, actually mostly looking at uh, flow path uh, predictions and some volumetric measurements. Um, so not so much uh, uh, pyroclastic flow models, um, but I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. Um, and uh, if we look down in the corner here, oh, the, the velocity of a Pohoi lava flow. Um, uh, it surges. Um, but usually it's over the course of a day, it is anywhere from, you know, 10 to 100 meters or so. Um, but it, it depends on the, 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 the amount of material being produced and the topography in front of the flow and some other things. But 
uh, it's usually something that you can walk faster than what it's doing. Um, this image is showing uh, a, a sort of a close up of an evolution of what turned out to be a, a breakout. And so we were also interested in understanding about can we use uh, this repeat imaging to make predictions about where the next breakout's going to occur. And it looks um, very intriguing. Um, you, can, you can see this under uh, this, 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 and again, I'm not a volcanologist, so I may be getting into trouble here, but um, we can see a raised um, feature that presumably as a, a channel of lava that eventually broke out and, uh, and expanded the flow on that side. So from November 11th to November 18th, you can see that big change. Um, there's a question here about clouds. Uh, occlusion in our imagery from clouds. So on occasion, weather does uh, cause us to stop. Um, but it very different from satellite imagery. When you're flying at uh, 120 meters or less, you're very often under the cloud deck. And so what might be completely um, you know, blanketed by clouds to the satellite, you can actually get some really good imagery uh, from your drone if you fly uh, low enough. Um, Pohoya lava flows, in my experience, um, there are breakouts and things can go kind of fast in that situation, um, but they are moving at kind of you know, human body scales that you know, we would watch this thing ooze and sort of move along uh, with uh, USGS geologists with us. And it was never a situation that um, it was going to, you know, immediately shoot out and run in front of us. We were very far from the, the source location. Um, yes, for thermal imagery, you can definitely get oversaturation problems. Um, and I can, I might show some imagery showing that. Um, and then difference in elevation between the 18th and the, the 11th. So the, the repeat imagery can be quite, quite valuable. And so luckily this lava flow uh, didn't reach the road. It, it only had limited um, impacts on the, the people's uh, homes and, 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 and livelihoods. Um, but we definitely learned some important uh, lessons from this 2014, 2015 crisis. The importance of establishing ground control, issues with obscuring smoke. So there's a question about clouds, but um, when the lava catches a lot of vegetation on fire or itself, yeah, mostly the catching vegetation on fire and creating a lot of smoke, that can cause um, ob obscuration issues that will result in problems for you to try to process the imagery and generate ortho mosaics. Um, uh, flight conditions, you know, the wind, uh, lighting conditions, if you try to fly at, you know, very, very early in the morning, it's gonna, you're gonna have a lot of shadow problems um, depending on the environment. So all these types of things were, um, were challenging. And then the limitations of the platform itself. That aircraft we were using could barely fly, you know, 16, 18 minutes. So we are definitely limited by the, by the aircraft. But also the importance of establishing relationships. So the relationships that we established with civil defense and the USGS in this 2014 uh, Bahoa flow allowed us to be in a position to contribute early on for the next, uh, the 2018 Kilauea eruption. And so that was an important lesson as well, um, just to sort of keep that in mind. So uh, we, uh, Nick Turner and Ken Hahn and I had a paper that came out of this looking at lava flow hazard prediction and monitoring with UAS uh, using the Pahoa lava flow uh, crisis as a uh, example. And so we compared our uh, paths of steepest descent against what the USGS maps uh, told. And one thing that just uh, is worth mentioning, you know, when there's development, when uh, people are building homes or shopping centers or such, the existing data sets don't often depict those. And so um, by the ability to generate very timely uh, information allows you to um, work with the conditions on the ground as they actually are, not what they were 50 years ago, which is what the maps might tell you. So that's just one thing uh, from, from that. Okay, so let's, uh, we've learned some things, or I learned some things from that experience, and let's fast forward a bit in time uh, to 2018. So this is a satellite image uh, of East, East Hawaii. So Hilo is up here um, in, this, in this bay in the north. Um, that's where we're located. I'm sitting right now. 
And then we've got the 2014-2015 uh, FOHOA flow outline uh, shown here. And to give you a sense about the, the where people live, um, this is an outline of uh, communities and properties. And so it, two are highlighted here, Kapoho and Leilani Estates. You may have heard this term at least, Leilani Estates. Um, yes, it's a sentinel image. That's not a drone image that I was using. Um, a little bit of background about the 2018 uh, eruption. Early May, lots of earthquakes, um, some road cracks uh, started to form, and then uh, some fissures developed, and um, and things got very exciting. Uh, Civil Defense on May 5th asked for UH Hilo's assistance to uh, map these new uh, lava flows. Um, at the time, USGS did not have any on-island uh, UAS capability, um, and it took them a little while to mobilize and get folks over from the mainland. And so uh, for a, a while there, um, UH Hilo was providing the UAS support for the eruption um, uh, by ourselves, and eventually USGS came over and then did it together, and then they eventually took over, which was, which was fantastic. Um, the uh, so we deployed that same day, and um, this is two of my crew getting ready, and we flew and we flew and we kept on flying, um, and this is just some of the the, the flight logs here. Um, we flew both visible and and thermal at the time. We didn't have this XT2, which has them both together in one sensor, so we would have separate flights for thermal and visible, and. We conducted more than 200 uh, flight operations in you know, a month or two month time. So it was quite a lot of uh, flying uh, that we did in support of uh, civil defense and, and USGS. And if this video works, this is the first um, uh, video that we collected. Let's see if it plays. Um, and this is from uh, fairly early on in the eruption event. Uh, this is the evening of uh, May 5th. And you'll see a number of these fissures which have opened up within Leilani Estates. And again, it's important to recognize that this is in the middle of a neighborhood of well-established homes uh, that we've got this uh, eruption occurring. This is not off in the jungle someplace, um, but it's right inside uh, a pretty major neighborhood in the uh, Puna area. And um, uh, eventually, uh, caused a, 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 a quite a bit of, of loss of, of, of property and has forever changed this, this, this location. Um, you can see a lot of the, the steam vents uh, have opened up, the cracks, and a lot of steam coming out, and then uh, a number of these uh, uh, fissures have, have, have popped up. So again, this was the first flight. Uh, this is a, just a video reconnaissance flight that we did, and then we also did um, mapping flights, autonomous mapping flights as well. But this is manual, as you can tell from the kind of jerky camera work uh, that's going on here. The equipment that we we're using at the time, uh, we were using Inspire 1, the one that was broken that I showed you earlier now. Um, and, and that was because that could carry the XT uh, thermal camera that we had, and we could only fly for about 14 minutes or so. Um, and we also had the Inspire 2, and that could fly a little bit longer. There's a question about uh, how, what we use for delineation of the lava flow. We started out just doing manual digitizing off of um, the ortho mosaics that we generated, but then uh, later on, we uh, uh, developed a script, um, uh, Matt, uh, developed a script for us to automatically delineate that, that outline, and then that would get shared with Civil Defense and USGS. Uh, a little bit about the, the flying environment. So this is a map here, and it's a TFR, and that stands for um, a temporary flight restriction. And so this is a type of notice that the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration here in the U.S., puts out that restricts air travel in a particular area due to a hazardous condition. And so basically the FAA shut this whole section of the airspace down, I think below 3,000 feet, I can't exactly remember, um, to any air traffic except those authorized by 
the uh, agency in command of the area, which was Hawaii County Civil Defense. So Hawaii County Civil Defense uh, basically took over this airspace. And then they said who was able to fly or not. Because they wanted my group to help them, uh, we worked with them and the FAA to get what's called an emergency COA, an emergency uh, certificate or waiver or authorization. And this allowed us to operate within the TFR. Um, and it allowed some things that we aren't normally allowed to do. So we could fly up to 1,000 feet. Normally, we can only fly up to uh, 400 feet. And it also allowed us to fly at night. Um, it also allowed us to fly beyond visual line of sight. And so during an emergency, you know, things are different than normal operations. And that allowed us to cover much larger areas than we normally would be, be able to. Uh, this is a photo showing um, me with much shorter hair in the Hawaiian shirt, uh, talking to uh, some different folks involved about the different flight operations which were occurring. And so there were, you know, a very small part of this were the, at least to start, were the, the, the drone operations, the UAS operations. There were a lot of helicopter operations occurring from both fire uh, and then also the, the, the National Guard. Um, and this is a uh, this this guy in the baseball hat is also is from the Department of the Interior. So everybody needs to be coordinating and talking because we don't want any kind of airspace conflicts. And so it's very important that everybody's on the same page. And, and leading all of this and coordinating all this is Hawaii County Civil Defense. Um, and so they're getting information from their fire hop, helicopter flights, emergency responders, the public. There's a, a source of imagery called pictometry that also came in. The USGS uh, was clearly um, the major scientific player in here, collecting data and information. This is their mandate. Uh, they did a lot of helicopter flights, but also geologist ground crews. And then eventually their drone teams came in and were able to participate, satellite imagery coming in. And again, the additional sessions will uh, talk a lot more about satellite imagery. And then my group uh, providing a lot of drone imagery and derived data, both to USGS and then to Hawaii Civil Defense. And we also had some partners that, that helped us uh, eventually. So Columbia University with Inat Lev uh, came out and then the Center for Robot Assisted Search and Rescue, which is a consortium from the mainland. They also uh, came out uh, for a few days to help. There are other sources of imagery that were also part of this, uh, Civil Air Patrol, and then the military and some other folks that also, uh, but again, we all had to sort of communicate with each other and make sure we're on the same page. Uh, civil defense uh, was able to provide some imagery, but they're at the time not really optimized for, for mapping. Um, USGS uh, only flew during the day for safety reasons, and they would do one to three flights a day. They made fantastic maps. This is a thermal map uh, created, um, probably Matt Patrick made this map, uh, showing uh, you know, large scale coverage of the area from the, from the helicopter. Um, the, the military, they can fly day or night, but they're also not really optimized for, for mapping. And then my crew, um, uh, which we've got a number of licensed pilots, you know, we're here at the university, we're a teaching institution, so we've got a bunch of students and alumni who are part of this, this effort. And uh, as I said, we flew, we flew a lot, um, often at night because that's when the helicopters were grounded and the lava keeps operating at night, doesn't care if it's daytime or nighttime. And so uh, we were able to provide updates uh, for folks uh, uh, throughout, the, throughout the night. Um, flying both visible and thermal uh, cameras. And this is, if it works, um, this is a, uh, uh, an image um, from uh, near the area. And actually it is partly the same area that was shown in the first, um, the first video. And again, you can see that these uh, fissures and uh, the lava flows which are coming out, they're quite clear, right? It's, it's very easy to delineate the flow because it's so hot, but you can also get some saturation issues depending on your, your camera settings. And I may have some other uh, later videos at all. Now, one thing to show is that the road here, these cracks in the road, um, it's not that great camera work, but um, if I can, well, you can see these vents occurring before the lava actually erupts um, uh, through the, 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 the temperature of the gases which are, are coming out of the cracks. 
and, and that was uh, quite useful. The um, operating conditions were um, uh, challenging. So a lot of cinder in the air on occasion, a lot of gas in the air. So there I am doing processing some data, wearing the, the gas mask. We had SO2 monitors and other gas monitors. And it also uh, often, again, it's East Hawaii, so it rained a lot. So I don't know how well you can see in the image, but there's a bunch of condensation on the, 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 the drone platform. And so we're always balancing, um, you know, operational safety, which is the number one thing, making sure the crew is safe and ready to evacuate at any uh, point, um, as well as trying to keep the birds in good operating condition and getting the imagery and data needed for civil defense and then USGS, which many times may just be that all they wanted was the coordinate of the leading edge of the flow, right? And, and so instead of having to map the whole thing, all they want is to know, you know, the GPS coordinates of where the flow is at any given particular amount of time. And so, you know, you, we're trying to communicate with these different groups and agencies. In addition to the gases, there is also, and this is in Pahoa, and so there's goats and there's wild animals. And so this is Roberto trying to keep his goat away from our, uh, our equipment. Um, and he did a good job. He's Puerto Rican. He's able to deal with goats. Um, and, uh, and so we got some, um, some pretty amazing uh, imagery in the course of, of this in addition to our, our mapping efforts. And again, you know, quite, quite an intensive time for the, the communities here. Uh, something like 700 homes were eventually um, destroyed, I believe. And the ramifications are still being felt by the community. Um, but our main efforts here were to map um, fissures and lava flow boundaries over time get at the rate and direction of advance and distance to critical infrastructure, uh, do damage assessment, um, and then other tasks, um, situational awareness uh, for first responders and mapping potential flow areas and so on. And so this is a, a map um, showing, uh, this is based on thermal data, showing some of the fissures um, as they were uh, popping up. Um, and then this is from the 5th of May in the evening um, the next afternoon, uh, Fisher 8 has started up here a little bit. Fisher 8 is the, the fissure that eventually turned into a big channelized flow and then some additional fissure. So we can put all these flights together to get at, you know, uh, 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 an impression of what the, what the flows are, are looking for. There's a question about does the land become useless once it's under lava flow? Um, for most intents and purposes, uh, yes. And uh, access to land, which gets cut off by lava flow, is also a, a big uh, challenge. Um, people are rebuilding out there, um, but it is, um, again, the community has been very strongly uh, changed by this event. But this is how uh, the island of Hawaii is built, by progressive lava flow. So this sort of comes with the territory to some degree. Um, uh, the different fissures that popped up and activated and then didn't activate over time, uh, it's very interesting. We're working with some folks from UH Manoa, Julia Hammer's group, a, a lot looking at Fisher 17. Um, this is uh, Fisher 17, a oblique view of this one. Um, you can see again, there's, there's uh, unfortunately, there were some uh, people that were thinking it was interesting to walk up there and check out. And I think they were all uh, safe, but that didn't seem like a very safe thing to do to me. And there's also, you know, homes right in the, right in the area. Um, I'm going to um, show you guys a video that we collected. Um, let's see, I'll do a new share if I can. All right, so let's see if I can play this thing. So it looks a little choppy. Um, but this is a liftoff from the road, and then you're going to see some image of imagery of uh, Fisher 17. And again, looks a little choppy, but hopefully you all can see this video okay.
And I actually haven't uh, showed this video uh, to too many people, I don't think. So you guys are, um, uh, what is a fissure? So a fissure is an actual opening in the Earth's surface where lava is coming out. Um, and so that's looking back towards Leilani. And you can see this line of additional fissures behind fissure 17. advance the video a little bit just to There's some interesting, as I said, um, mineralogy work going on with uh, lava erupted from these different um, fissures. I, I believe fissure 17 was a much older um, uh, pocket of, of lava than what eventually came out from um, fissure 8, which is the main lava channel that eventually was really changed the landscape. So there's a question about, so, so not everyone had been evacuated or had chosen to evacuate at this time, um, but many of them had. Uh, there's a question about the camera angle. So we're able to um, adjust the, uh, the pitch of the, the camera. So it's on a gimbal uh, so that we are able to um, change the, the camera angle as needed. Um, yes, there is a lot of guidance for the people um, living there and there's a lot of evacuation occurring, um, uh, but people also have a choice about what they, what they do. In this lava flow, no one, no one died, which is fantastic, and we're very happy about that. But some people did get injured, um, often through making uh, poor choices, um, uh, but, but no, one, no one died, even though uh, hundreds of homes were, 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 were taken out. Yes, it does look a little surreal. It was, it was a very um, amazing uh, environment to operate in, and the sounds and the smells were all uh, something that I'll never, never forget. Um, so I think that gives you a, a flavor of, of that one. I'm going to go back to the, the PowerPoint here. <clears throat> and so, um, so that was just some videography work, um, but we also did uh, kind of normal mapping runs. And so this is an evolution of Fisher 17 over just the course of an hour or so. So this is what it looked like at 12.09 at p.m. on the 13th. Um, this is what it looked like at 12.49 uh, p.m., so just 40 minutes later. And then this is what it looked like um, a, an hour later than that. And so I'll just you know, cycle through these a little bit. I'll go um, back to 12.09. Uh, Looks like there might be a little bit of a delay. And then I'll uh, go forward again. So to 1249, and then to uh, 141 in the afternoon. Um, the land is owned a lot of individuals, uh, but also the state owns some land there. But uh, many private uh, homeowners lost their lost their land, completely covered up by lava. This is a house that was right there. Um, you can see the roof has been damaged by lava bombs. Uh, eventually, this house was, um, I believe, uh, completely taken out by, by Fisher 8. Um, but if you look closely, you can see in between the two flights, if you see where my cursor is, I'll go back and forth a little bit. So we're picking up you know, these, these bombs actually um, being dropped on the, dropped on the landscape. Um, and there was still some, unfortunately, there was still some activity at that home. We saw some cars and, and some of the imagery and then they're gone in others. So, um, but again, to my knowledge, nobody got injured at that house. Um, so we use this mapping to generate these flow outlines over time. And that was shared with the, the community. Civil Defense uh, did a great job in the county 
GIS office. Great job of sharing this information. Um, and, but this area, the Kapoho Beach Road area, this is an area, if the videos work, that we flew and captured right when it was going to cross the, um, and reach, cross the road and reach the, reach the ocean. And you can see the saturation issues here in the thermal, the settings that we, that we had. But it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a, a road here off to the left, and then, you, and then that's all ocean out there. Um, and so this is a little bit before the lava uh, crossed, crossed the road. And then if we go a little bit longer, a uh, little, this is, it's right at the road. So it's a right, you know, touching the road right at this moment that we're capturing the imagery. And again, you can see the shoreline out over here. And then the last video in the sequence, just a little bit later, this is, we're farther away because we are uh, nervous and we don't want to be too close to this. And so uh, we captured this from, from further away because the road had been uh, cut off at this point. And uh, at this point, the lava has reached all the way to the, to the, uh, the shore. And you can see it spilling out into the ocean. And when it did that, it created all kinds of steam and generated its own weather. It's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. So, Yep, we worked with USGS and civil defense and helped to create these flow outlines. Eventually, civil, USGS uh, took over most of the mapping, um, but we're able to create visualizations like this. What you're seeing here is sort of colored by the lava advance over time. And, um, and then eventually, all these uh, were, all these lava flow outlines were collected into a geospatial database. Um, uh, by USGS, and then I'm also a part of this, and this has been released for anyone to access and uh, and work with in a, in a GIS environment. Um, oh, we're, we're close. I need to move a little faster. We also did some uh, lava flow uh, hover flights, which were um, quite quite interesting, and um, where we basically. Um, uh, set up over a channel, and then we then we just uh, hover. And so let me share one of these uh, videos with you all so you can see this. Um, so so we set up four, and I'll show you a video from 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 one of these. Let me change my, my screen share to the to the new video. Let's see this guy, and then hopefully it'll uh, it'll play smoothly for you. But this will give you a sense about um, what this uh, what this looks like. So there's Fisher Eight, uh, the source of this uh, channelized lava flow, and then uh, we can set up because the drone can hover over the channel and uh, just uh, stay stationary. If my camera operator would stop moving, and uh, allow us to um, get at um, basically discharge. Right, and, and so uh, work was uh, being done. Let me go back to my uh, PowerPoint slide. To turn that information into um, uh, lava flow dynamics work, looking at the velocity, uh, thinking about how much material is actually, um, you know, moving through, and thinking about the depth and sort of. Um, Really interesting work. Uh, Hannah Dietrich's done a lot of this. Also, INAT Lab and some other other folks. Um, USGS is using our uh, data, uh, looking at uh, crack mapping. This is um, uh, Carolyn Parchetta's uh, doing some work with the interns about this. Um, ground control. Again, some lessons learned. The importance of ground control, and it's good to use pre-existing uh, features. Let me see if I can uh, go back. So what? This is Victor. What he's doing right here is he's, he's, he's surveying in the end of this road marking. And so that existed, right? I did that, that existed before we went out and spray painted anything. So if you can use pre existing um, features and, and get the coordinates of those, that's fantastic because that allows you to, to go back further in time. Again, if you're dealing with lava flows, uh, they're going to cover up your, your ground control points. Uh, that's just part of the, part of the game. 
the ground's also moving. There's you know big cracks that are opening and such, and so this is also um, this is also a, a challenge. Um, communication again, communication is key. So you've got manned aviation occurring. You've got the Army National Guard flying, and so everybody's got to communicate with each other. Eventually, an, a dedicated air traffic controller came in and was super helpful. Um, but you got to make sure everybody stays safe. So good communication, uh, safe operations, and then uh, certainly, you know, having qualified crews able and have the equipment they need to on the ground ready to go to deal with this type of a, a situation. USGS, fantastic. Uh, it just took them a little while to, to, to come on island. At this point now, I think they've got some dedicated UAS capability that's ready to go, uh, as opposed to having to wait to fly people over. So we, everybody's learned a lot from this event, and it's been, uh, it's been fantastic. Um, and then the, the data that are generated, uh, so the question about students among the crew, yes, in my group, lots of questions. Both masters and undergraduate students were helping out. Um, and then all the data that gets generated and, and, and sent to civil defense, there needs to be folks there that are able to deal with this data. And unfortunately, sometimes the chair of that person wasn't there because they didn't adequately staff that position. Um, so again, you can generate a bunch of data, but if people aren't there to, to be able to deal with it in a timely manner, that's sort of a more of an emergency management type of question, but definitely uh, an issue. And then just to kind of get you guys uh, geared up for the coming sessions, which are focusing more on satellite imagery, is just a sequence of images um, uh, showing the pre-eruption. You can see the issues with clouds that, that come, right? And so that's not that helpful. Um, but this is uh, pretty early on, 13th of May, 18th, the 23rd, nice clear day. This is the road crossing that we captured with the, 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 the drones. This is, this is after that. Um, this is uh, where Kapoho got taken out. And this progression of the channel. Yeah, and you can see what a difference to our, to our, our coastline uh, this has been and definitely impacted a lot of our, our community members here. Um, so thank you uh, very much for your attention and, and, and time. I do have a, a, a poll for you guys to work. My apologies, I don't know that there's time for the dedicated breakout session. If there's a lot of clamoring for folks that want to stay later and participate in breakout, I can, I can set that up. Um, but basically at, at this point, uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions and then I can also uh, start a poll so that you guys can um, work on that if there's any any questions. So let me find the right. Okay, so you should see a poll that's popped up. So if you wouldn't mind uh, filling that out, it's a very brief poll. And again, if there's any uh, questions you have, I'm happy to happy to address them. And thank you all so much for your uh, participation. This has been really great. And I do encourage you to um, stick around for the additional, so session two, which will start in about an hour. Um, uh, that should be fantastic. And uh, then tomorrow there are uh, uh, two more sessions. Let me, uh, I can pull up the schedule here, I think. I can try to, and then I can see if there's some uh, questions that are that are coming up. All right, so that gives you the information about the upcoming sessions. Um, so the thermal images, yes, we can also georeference the thermal images and create these ortho mosaics from the thermal imagery. Um, uh, if you have, if you, if you uh, collect the appropriate thermal imagery. Um, there's a question here about uh, explaining communicating hazards and risks uh, through the use of maps and geospatial data. I will say that the, the, the USGS communications group did a, a totally great job. 
uh, and communicate, I think, uh, we can always do better. Um, but so a lot of our imagery and data were converted into maps that then were then shared out by the communications groups from the county and the USGS. So my group wasn't exactly involved in that direct communication. We were kind of busy collecting the data and producing it. Um, but I, I think we can always do better. I think in the 2018 eruption, the civil defense um, put out daily maps showing the, the lava flow outlines, in part from uh, work that my group did and USGS. And, and, so, and so I think those were really helpful because that was a, a, a source, a reliable source of information for people to see where the lava flow was at time and also where they were thinking it might go. So if there's heavy smoke, better to take oblique. Um, so if there's heavy smoke, yes, you want to position your aircraft in a way where your line of sight is going to give you the best view of what it is that you're interested in, in seeing. And often that means also changing the direction of your camera so you have some oblique information. Um, let's see. Great. Um, the presentation will be available. It's going to be saved and then uh, hosted by the IEEE. I don't exactly know how they're going to do that, but you might need to be a, a member to, to see that, that saved posted uh, video. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the details about that. I just made the presentation. Um, and again, please stick around. The next presentation will be in about an hour. And, uh, and that's going to be Scott Rowland with SAR Interferometry and uh, should be really good. Um, and hopefully I haven't missed anybody's questions. There's, there's just a lot of information coming here. And, uh, is it possible to mount SWIR sensors to penetrate AOD in SUAS? I don't know what AOD stands for, um, but uh, so like a Matrice um, 600, that has a payload of about five kilograms. So if you can, um, uh, oh, again, I'm looking for AOD, but I don't know what that stands for. So these larger drones are capable of carrying um, more uh, payload, and, and the drone doesn't care what it's carrying, as long as it's not going to interfere with the operation. Um, so how do you get certificates? OK, so from these polls and other things, we'll be able to say who participated. And then they will send out emails about the certificates. So I will, I will pass all that information on to the IEEE folks, and then they will um, uh, be able to share that information with you. So uh, I see some, yep, again, thank you. Thank you guys very much. Um, the poll, you should be able to see the poll. Um, if you're not seeing the poll, there might be an option to see that. But if you're getting on it from a smartphone or something, as I said in the email, you might not have that, that, that poll capability. And it looks like most people are doing the, doing the poll. We got 112 people that have been able to do the poll so far. So I'll just let, I'll just let that rip um, for the next uh, five or 10 minutes as, as people figure out their polling. And again, please, and it's going to be a separate link for the um, session two. So you should have gotten an email with a different link for session two. So it's not this Zoom meeting, it's a different Zoom meeting link. So you'll once you're done here, you can close out this meeting and then that other meeting will start up again in an hour or so. And, um, and so again, it's not the same link as this one, it's a different Zoom link. All right, thank you all.